Let's pray and ask God. powerful video this morning to introduce our message today uh it you know we're talking about you know he deserved death for what he did he stole uh, and and the word of god says that we deserve death but actually uh we're gonna i'm not talking about he got life today amen and you get life how many are thankful to get life from the lord would you praise him this morning amen such a blessing to see all these young people up on the front row this morning and if your kids are not here please get them to church on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings to get the word of God in their life what a blessing it is to have young people that are on fire for Jesus Christ how many happy about that <clears throat> amen well I want to preach this morning and I just want to just tell you at the outset this is probably not going to be charming but I really feel in my spirit that I want to preach from God to touch one person today and if one person, if their outcome has changed this morning, it's worth it. And at the outset, I want to just say this, and I hate to admit it. Look at your neighbor and say, he hates to admit this. But I actually stole a, a pack of baseball cards when I was a kid. From a fill sack That's what used to be a Circle K, but it was a fill sack And I took it at his word. I filled my sack stole those baseball cards and I think I can't remember the whole story but I actually never got caught but I think I actually got felt so convicted and so condemned actually um, that I just took them back and put them back on the the rack and I remember it was almost as hard to put them back on the rack because you you know you were gonna you might get caught putting them back on the rack and feel just about as guilty if they catch you now I never got caught and uh and I also want to say this this morning. I was whipped one time, and I didn't deserve it. But I think that because I didn't get caught stealing the cards, and I got whipped when I didn't deserve it, it all works out. Now, I wish I, I, wish I could say this this morning, that I wish that was the last time, Brother Johnny, that I'd ever sinned. But it's not. I, I wish my sin had stopped there, but it didn't. See, what I deserved for my life of sin was death. But instead, praise God, I got life. I got to live. I got forgiveness. I have hope in my life. Amen. I have mercy in my heart today. I have grace in my soul. Is there anybody in my situation? And you'll put your hands together and say, Pastor, I agree with you. That is my situation this morning. Let me say this, if God didn't forgive sinners, heaven would be empty. The truth is, brothers and sisters, I have good news this morning and bad news all at the same time, that we are all guilty of breaking God's laws. I am in a house full of people who have broken God's laws before. I'm in a house full of people 
who have broken God's heart too. In fact, James, the word of God says in the book of James chapter 2, it says, for the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. Even when I stole that pack of cards, it does you you laughed at when I told you I stole the pack of cards. Because we tend to rank sin in levels of he's just a kid and he stole the cards. He's a murderer and we think different. If I would have said I murdered someone, you would have gasped. But the word says that anyone that breaks one law is as guilty as another that has broken all the laws. And church, we have to believe that. We have to believe that. And if we are going to continue to be a church that loves people, and that we continue, and if we are going to continue to be a church, a church that's not building a church, you see, see, we're not building a church. We are a place that loves one person at a time. And if we're going to continue to be a church that loves one person at a time, we have to believe the scripture is for all of us and for one of us all at the same time. You see, if you have lusted once, if you've cheated once, if you've lied once, if you've gossiped once, if you've judged somebody, if you've coveted, if you've had a foul mouth, if you've disrespected your parents, if you've abused your body and put stuff in it that's not supposed to be there, you are guilty and you've broken God's laws and you deserve death. But I'm here this morning to say you can get life. Amen. You can get life. How do you know, Pastor, that we deserve death? Because the Word of God says in Romans chapter 6, it says, For the wages of sin is not life, but the wages of sin is death. But since I'm a preacher in this generation, I've come with the good news this morning. I've come with the good news that God still loves you and that God still cares for you. And I don't care what you've done. And I don't care how many covenants you've broken. I don't care how many laws you've broken. I don't care how you've abused your body. I don't care if you abused your body last night. I don't care if you have things inside of you that are not supposed to be inside of you. I'm here to tell you this morning that God still loves you. There is good news in the house. And there's hope in the house. God loves you. And God cares for you. And God will do anything for you this morning. How many of you have somebody that loves you? Would you raise your hand? That's awesome. How many of you have somebody that loves you? Here's, here's the next part of it. Be careful. How many of you have somebody that loves you? Can I say that again? Somebody that loves you. You know that somebody loves you. Amen. If somebody didn't raise their hand, look at them and say, I love you. <laughs> Literally. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Now, here's the next part of it. How many of you that have somebody that loves you and you know that person will die for you? Would you also raise your hand? You know somebody that would die for you? Less hands. Less hands. But let me tell you this, brothers and sisters. You may not have raised your hand, but somebody already died for you. Amen. Jesus died for you. And I want to tell you the story this morning of when he died. Because he was not the only one that died that day. On that hill called Golgotha, which means the skull. It, on that hill, dying with him that day were two other criminals. The word of God says in Luke chapter 23 that two other men, both criminals, they thought so little of Jesus. They wanted to demoralize Jesus so much. That they, that they murdered him. They killed him with criminals on each side of him. They were also led out with Jesus to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, why is it called the skull? Because historians tell us that so many people were crucified on that hill. There were so many skulls. There were so many bones. There were so many dead bodies left on that hill with the fragments that remained. So many skulls of victims that had died on crosses. Do you know 
that the Romans crucified so many people, they ran out of wood. And when they ran out of wood, they had to create other ways for people to be executed because they killed so many Jews and so many victims. So many were crucified there. It was called the skull. One on the right and the other on the left. You know, a crucifixion was the most expensive way to kill somebody. It took four Roman soldiers and a centurion. The Roman government had to pay all five of those men to be there to execute one person. It was a very, very expensive way to kill people and to, to, to punish people in that day. It was also the greatest way to publicly humiliate someone. They never crucified someone on the back streets of, of the city because it was illegal to do so, first of all. But they crucified them near major intersections. So if they lived in our city, they would get a major intersection and they would crucify someone there. Because they wanted everyone to know this is what's going to happen to you if you follow this way. And they also did it so the passerbyers could shout out cursings to them and humiliate them and mock them. It was the way the Romans would make the greatest impact statement. Let me tell you this. When you study crucifixions from the Romans, it was pain. They hung there. Some of them would hang there for days. And the stronger they were, the, the more they lasted because they would push themselves up to breathe. Let me tell you what, it's not a beautiful, you saw that beautiful picture of a cross in this picture and it almost looked majestic. Let me tell you, it was far from that. And I don't criticize these people that make these beautiful pictures because at least we remember the crucifixion. But let me tell you what, it wasn't like these pictures because they hung there for days and they would bleed and they would, and they would begin to smell and the flies would swarm them. The heat was so bad, they would breathe by pushing up. Birds would come in with their beaks and peck at their body. It was a horrible situation. Verse, the Word of God tells us in verse 39, one of the criminals who, criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus and asked Him, aren't you the Messiah? If you are, save yourself and us. But the Word says, but the other criminal rebuked Him saying, don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. But we are getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. I come here this morning to say that we are, we are one of these two thieves. That every one of us sitting in this building today, you are one of these two thieves. Amen. I don't know their names. The Bible doesn't give their name. I don't know where they came from or what they actually did. But they were criminals. I do know that. But you are one of these two thieves. See, the Word of God says in verse 39, one of the criminals hurled, hurled insults at Jesus and asked, aren't you the Messiah? And if you are, then save yourself and then save us. You see, the first thief was the unrepentant thief. And there are some here today that no matter how good or bad or whatever the Word means to you this morning, if you had a great preacher or just a medium preacher or a less preacher this morning, you would never repent. He was arrogant. He had pride. He was, even on the cross, he, he was critical. He had a critical spirit. There's some here today that you will always have a critical spirit and it will never leave you because you're unrepentant. He was entitled almost. He, he felt like he, des, he, that, he, that, he need, that somehow he deserved to get off that cross without ever repenting. He had no fear of God. There's actually people that sit here, sit here today in this church, and you know it, but you have no fear of God. No need for a Savior. Entitled mindset, mindset unrepentant. If you heal me, then I, will, then I will believe, is your motto. Heal my daughter, and if you do that for me, then I will believe, but I won't believe unless you do that. If you give me a job and bless me, then I will be a part of your church and I will give and I will, I will repent. If you bless me, if you heal my children, if you heal my grandchildren, then I will do this and I will do that. 
That's the first one. He's the unrepentant thief. And now let's talk about the second one. He says, he asked his, his, na- his, his other criminal, basically, thug that he hung out with, don't you fear God? Since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly. So in other words, he owns his sin. He owns his sin and says, for we are getting what we, what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. He was repentant. He feared God. He, his heart broke even on that cross and said, he was humbled and said, hey, listen, we, we're getting what we deserve. We knew this. When we broke in and when we killed that person and we stuck, took their things out of their house. We knew that this was the that we might get what we're getting right now. We deserve what we're getting. He was desperate even and said, Lord, if it be possible, I want to come to your kingdom with you. He saw the need for forgiveness. He asked his friend, he said, his thug friend, he says, Don't you fear God? He had some concept of God. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, it's an important concept. Because our world today has a different view of sin than it used to have. And I look at people like Kim Davison, who stood for something that was right and against her biblical beliefs over in the, in Southeast, uh, in, in the Southeast. And she stood and she wouldn't marry a gay couple. And they threw her in jail for her beliefs for, that were based on the Word of God. Yet, in our world today, there's a clerk in Florida who won't marry straight people, but he never went to jail. What is the difference between the two? One goes to jail because she stands on the word of God, and the other doesn't go to jail. What's the difference? It's because one was standing on the word of God, and the other is not standing on the word of God. And our world almost looks criminally at a Christian. In fact, if you're a radical Christian today, you're almost in a bad situation in our world today because the world looks differently at sin. But this story I give you in the Bible this morning is a, is a sinner that says, I need salvation. I, I have got my reward, and I am nailed to this cross, and there's a reason I'm here. But I also believe, Jesus, that you are the Messiah. And I believe, Lord, that if it's your will that, that I might perish on this cross in a fleshly form, form, but you have the power to, Lord, come in and to save me and to bring me to your paradise and to give me something I don't deserve. I deserve death, but you've given me life. You can give me life. Let me tell you something that's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing that both of these men... We're equally close to salvation, Jason. They each were crucified the same distance away from Jesus. Equally close to salvation. Both thieves were guilty. There was not one thief that was better than the other. They were both in the same condition. Both equally deserving to die. Both saw and heard what had happened in those six hours on that cross. Both were suffering severely. Both were dying and needed forgiveness. The difference is, is one recognized his need and the other didn't. And what I worry about this morning is this. Let me pay close attention. I won't be a long time this morning. I'm preaching for one person. And what worries me this morning as a pastor of this church and even as evangelist for this city this morning is that that same situation could happen here today. People sitting side by side in this sanctuary this morning, Chaplain Bacon. They've, you've heard that there's, there's, there's people that's sitting on the same row that's heard the same songs. Your ears heard the same songs that the praise team sung this morning. You, you're hearing the same message that the other person is hearing. And one person is going to say, I have no need for that. I have no need for that. I'm not ready for that. This is not the time for that. But the other is going to say, this is my chance. Praise God. This is my moment. I am tired of the life I'm living. Praise God. I 
deserve death, but I will receive life if God will give it to me. Amen. I'm preaching for somebody this morning. Then Jesus said, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus answered, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And oftentimes in communion, I I talk about this word remember, but I want to stop just for a moment and tell you this. That when Jesus, when he asked Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That word remember is like this word. That if you, they took your body and they cremated your body and there was ashes. And then they took your ashes and they threw them out over the sea. That when the thief said the word remember here, he was saying, Jesus, I believe that if they took my body and cremated it and there was ashes and they took it and threw it over the sea. That though the wind and the waves would separate those fragments of my body all over the ocean. Lord God, you have, Jesus, you have so much power. You have so much authority. You have so much dominion, Lord. That you have the power to remember where each piece of my body is spread throughout the ocean. And you have the power to remember where they're at. Amen. Hallelujah. You have the power, Lord. I believe. See, he was really saying, Jesus, I believe you're that kind of Savior. You're not like one of us. But you, Lord, you are, you're here. You don't deserve to be here. I deserve to be here, but you don't deserve to be here. You are so powerful that you can remember my body when they've taken it off this cross. You can remember where the fragments go. And you have the power to bring it all back together again. He was saved, saved by grace of God through faith. Hey, folks, we are saved by grace. Brother Mike, he didn't deserve anything. I want you to think about this. He, 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 it is not religion that saves you. This church cannot save. We are not a church. We are not a church. We're people. We're, we just come here so we can love one more person next week and one more person this week in Jesus' name. We are not a religion. You're not saved by how much you pray. Should you pray? Yes. But you're not saved by how much you pray. You're not saved by how much you give. Should you give? Yes, you should give. You're not saved by how much you speak in tongues. Yes, should you, should you be full of God's Spirit? Absolutely. Would you speak with tongues? Yes. But I'm here to say this morning, you're not saved by how much you speak in tongues. Examine this. This thief, the Lord says, today you will be with me in paradise. Think about this, brothers and sisters. He never went to church. This is going to really mess up your theology. He never was baptized. He couldn't get baptized. Guess what? He was on a cross. He never spoke in tongues. It had not happened yet. He never gave in an offering. He never could walk the straight and narrow. He never became a disciple of Christ. His feet were bound to the cross. He couldn't get loose. He couldn't get loose. He could never perform any good works. His hands were He couldn't even turn over a new leaf. He was dying. He couldn't join a church. He couldn't get off the cross. The only thing that he could do was trust in the grace and the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Lord, please remember me when you come to your kingdom. Hallelujah. And God saw so much in his heart that he says today, truly today. Hallelujah. 
Psalms 103.10 says this this morning, God does not treat us as our sins deserve. I deserve it. I deserve it. Right here, not, not somebody else around. I deserve it. I deserve it. I deserve that cross. But he but thank God, aren't you thankful this morning, church? Aren't you thankful to do this morning that though we deserve the worst outcome? Amen. That if, if God, if, if we would, if the Lord would just pray us up in front of this church and wake make our lives transparent, it would reveal some ugly stuff, and people would go, oh, I never knew that about him. Oh my goodness, I never knew that about her. And we deserve death. Just like the man that pulled the machine and it came to death for him. We deserve that. God does not treat us though as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Hallelujah. I'm preaching about the good news. I'm preaching about the good news this morning. Look at that. He takes our sins. And look at this word. He removes them. Another uh, translation says that he takes our sins and he blots them out. Though our sins are scarlet. He takes a die and he dyes our heart and makes it white again. Let me tell you what, brothers and sisters, we better never forget that people don't go to heaven because they're good people. People go to heaven because they're forgiven people. Praise God. Praise God. You see, our king is different. Thank you, young people. king is different instead of sitting on a throne he was hung on a cross instead of wearing a golden crown he wore a crown of thorns instead of being surrounded by servants he was surrounded by thieves he was innocent and deserved to live but for us he was willing And that is why in the word that it says when he died, the earth shook and the sky went dark and there was an earthquake and the centurion that had been guarding him shouted out, surely this was the son of God. On the third day, the stone was rolled away. Because the wages of sin is death. But it was rolled away because the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Would you stand with me and put your hands together this morning? Those lights dim this morning just a little bit. I want to ask you a question here in just a moment. So prepare yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, prepare yourself. He's going to ask a question here in just a moment. Before I ask you a question, I want to read a scripture out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. The scripture says, 1 Peter 1, 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great, look at that word, great mercy. He has given us new birth, our new life, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. New birth. 
All of us. Look at your neighbor and say, you deserve to die. You deserve to die. That's terrible, isn't it? Man, that's really negative, Pastor. No, I, I'm just telling you what the Word says. I mean, it's tough preaching the Word because you can't get away from the truth of it. We deserve to die. We, could, we deserve for the light to come up and say, death. But God is so powerful. We got life. We got life. Let me ask you this this morning. <clears throat> every head's bowed and every eye's closed for just a moment. We're going to just reach here this morning for a moment. Why don't we just pray right now in the name of Take your person's hand beside you and just hold it for a moment and pray over that person right now in the name of Jesus. Let's let the Holy Spirit move in this house right here today. I feel a powerful move of the Holy Spirit in this place right now. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray. Come on. Travail over that person in Jesus' name. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Lord, for every person that's in this house today, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I ask you, Lord, to touch lives here this morning. Lord, people sitting here and standing here this morning in the same condition as those two thieves on the cross with Jesus, both deserving death, one of them getting life, one of them, one of them getting remembrance, Lord, and the other not getting life, but getting death and no remembrance, no grace, no mercy. Both hearing the same Jesus. Both being in the same setting. One chooses life and the other chooses death, God. And Lord, this morning, there are folks sitting here today in this house and they've heard the same songs. They're hearing the same message. And they're getting the same invitation this morning. And I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you just help them right now to make up their minds to receive life here today. To receive life. Let me ask a question. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, the only one that's going to be looking around is myself this morning. And I'm just going to look at the top of your heads. I don't, I'm not even going to see faces. But is there anybody here that wants a new life, would you raise your hand? You want a new life. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody's looking. Nobody's looking. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You may put your hands down. Now, let me tell you what, brothers and sisters. Amen. You're standing next to a person. There was quite a few people that raised their hands right now. And I don't know what new life meant for those that raised their hand. It might mean salvation. It might mean a new start. It might mean they, they're in a situation they need to get out of. Amen. In Jesus' name, it shall be done right here today. God bless you. Look up here for just a moment. I don't know what the situations are that raise their hand. Perhaps there's people that want new life salvationally. They want to give their life to Jesus afresh and anew. Maybe you've already done that, but you found yourself into a pattern that you don't like in your life. Whatever that pattern might be, whether it's you're attracted to the wrong things, the wrong situation, whatever it is this morning, but you raise your hand and you said, Pastor, I want new life here today. I want new life. Amen. I want to ask you this morning, church, would you bring that, would, would you step up to the front of this church this morning? You no doubt you're going to bring somebody with you. Grab that person's hand beside you and step to the front of this church. In Jesus' name, you want new life here today. You're going to bring somebody with you that wants a new life here this morning. There was at least 50 people that raised their hands. You're bringing somebody with you that wants new life. Thank God for these beautiful young people this morning. I've got good news. Amen. We serve a God that remembers you. We serve a God that remembers you. Hallelujah. You want a fresh start here this morning. You've done some things you're not proud of, but you want a fresh start here this morning. It's in the house. New beginnings in the house. Fresh starts in the house. Amen.